lost, deep within the soul of all mankind, there is a hidden cauldron of terror. Fed by the flames of madness. From this steaming devil's brew come the awesome tales and horror legends that live in our worst nightmares and haunt us through the hours of darkness. The vilest of these, and more grotesque than any specter of our imagination, are the stories of the eternally damned creatures of the night who stalk the shadows in a perpetual and desperate search for human blood. Beware, then, the rustle of bats' wings. Beware the tortured scream that comes from nowhere. Beware the black cloud that covers a clear moon. Beware the ice-cold wind that grips your heart. For these are the signs of the vampire. area of Transylvania, beyond the plains of Marosh and the slopes of Gorgeni, there is a narrow road which winds through dank and misty forests, lying across the foothills of the Wallachian Alps. There are no milestones along this road, no signposts to point the way. Some believe that it is a road without end, others that it disappears amidst the swirling fogs that mantle the woods. But there are a few, shepherds and the like, who will tell you in hushed tones that it leads to Castle Dracula. Many years ago, a strange hooded figure limped slowly and painfully along this road. His garb was black and engrimed with the dirt of ages. His body twisted by the countless miles he had traveled. And about his neck, he wore a bell that tinkled with every step he took. He saw before him the gray towers the steep walls and the staring, empty windows of the castle. His skin was parchment yellow. This was Ka, high priest of the Temple of the Seven Golden Vampires of Ping Kuei in the province of Sichuan, in the far mysterious land of China. For him, this was the end of a journey, a cursed pilgrimage which had brought him halfway round the world. He came to Castle Dracula to seek a boon. When the golden vampires walked in Pinque, he was the center of all power. The people there feared him and lived in dread of the hosts he served, the hosts known as the undead. But now the vampiric creatures slept and the power was lost. He came now to the arch vampire, to Count Dracula. He came to unlock the black secrets of immortality, 
He came to unleash the blood-red fountain of demonic power. being will ever know what happened in the grim vaults beneath the castle. No one will ever know of the black horrors practiced before the tomb of Count Dracula that night. But before the light of dawn came to dissolve the nightmare, a creature emerged from the castle. Its garb was still black and engrimed with the dirt of ages. Its body still twisted by the countless miles it had traveled, about its neck, the bell still tinkled dully with every limping step it took. Beneath the hooded cowl there gleamed the parchment yellow oriental face of Ka. But as the cruel lips parted, they laid bare the sharp fangs of a vampire. And the aura that seemed to cling to the creature had about it the stench of Count Dracula, Lord of the Undead. Thus was a curse reborn in a distant land. A curse recorded in words of blood. A curse that echoed across the years. The legend of the seven golden vampires. <laughs> Legends of ancient China have their roots in the mists of time. Some are awesome and terrifying in their implication. Some are real and have their foundations in truth. I had heard of a doomed village somewhere in the vast center of China, a place that becomes cursed each year at the time of the seventh moon. It cringes in fear as it listens to the distant cries of souls in torment. And terror strikes deep into the souls of the inhabitants. The whispered word is vampire, and the horror is real and very close. Seven creatures, seven ghastly monsters with golden masks hiding the evil decay of their faces, are reincarnated as the moon travels higher in the sky. From their temple beyond the Dragon Teeth Mountains in the Mitchung Shung, they sweep down on the village of Pingue on fiery black horses.
They carry golden swords, and at their breasts hang the strange gleaming bat medallions that are their life force. It is blood that the seven vampires seek, fresh red blood from the young bodies of the maidens of Pink Way. New blood drawn from living flesh. They take their victims back to the sinister temple. In the center is a stone cauldron. Emanating from it like the shafts of a star are seven stone slabs. And roped to each is a squirming, terror-stricken, half-naked village girl. The vampires dig their sharp fangs into their necks, the blood flows, the screams die away. The ghastly ritual is over. It is said that long, long ago, a farmer of the district, whose name was Si Tin Yen, crazed with anguish for his lost daughter, fought the vampires. His only weapon was a wooden stay. <laughs> He could not hope to destroy them and must have known that he would die in the attempt, as indeed he did, most horribly. But as they slashed him down, he tore the bat medallion from the breast of the seventh golden vampire. Deprived of its mystical life force, the creature twisted in agony and screamed before it crashed to the ground. As the mist of death closed over Si Tin Yen's eyes, he saw the monster disintegrate amidst an appalling mass of putrefying flesh, until all that remained was the smoldering golden mask. My name is Van Helsing. Lawrence Van Helsing, Professor of Anthropology and the Occult Sciences at the University of London. My own confrontation with the infamous Count Dracula, occurring as it had some years before, left me in no doubt that there might be a basis of truth in this story. So when the University of Chongqing invited me to deliver a course of lectures, I sailed willingly for China. I took with me my son, Leyland, and we arrived in the city at the end of August. Consulting the Oriental calendar, I noted that we were approaching the time of the seventh moon in the year of the snake. There were very few foreigners in Chongqing at this time. Indeed, the only others we came in close contact with were the British trade consul and an attractive Swedish lady, Mrs. Vanessa Buren. The latter was a vivacious person of independent character and equally independent means, both of which qualities she would need in order to travel virtually unaccompanied in China at the end of the century. My son Leyland had attended Mrs. Buren at a soiree given by the consul. There she had evidently received the unwelcome attentions of a certain General Leon Hong, a local and very powerful warlord. She rebuked him and declined his offer of protection and the dubious pleasure of his company. Instead, she asked Leyland if he would escort her home. They were given an escort by the consul, but the streets of Chongqing at that hour were dark and full of sinister shadows. I suppose they were no more than halfway home before the attack came. From all directions, they were suddenly assailed by the general's assassins. <laughs> Knives glittered in the moonlight as the escorts turned to defend Mrs. Buren and my son. They were outnumbered by the cutthroats. 
They were hacked and slashed and left to die in pools of their own blood. Then there was that ominous, terrible silence that always seems to follow moments of intense violence and horror. The arrow, a sparkling silver shaft, seemed to come from nowhere. It flew through the darkness with incredible speed and buried itself in the throat of the nearest of General Leon Horn's men. They turned to see the bow, a solitary figure, proud, disdainful, dressed in the ancient robes of some priestly order. Already he was fitting a second shaft to the bowstring, even as the stricken assassin fell to his knees and then crashed into the dust of the alleyway. Now the others advanced to meet this unexpected threat. It was always said that the followers of General Leon Hong were invincible. It would surely take little effort to destroy a single bowman. But even as they moved forward, a second figure appeared, a giant of a man wearing the same strange robes, but wielding in his hands a pair of massive silver battle axes. As though to draw attention to himself, he clashed the thick, broad blades together like some monstrous symbol. To Mrs. Buren and Leyland, it sounded like a martial invitation to do battle. The assassins screeched their defiance and ran to meet the challenge. They swarmed about the robed axeman like furious bees around a swirling moth. The blades flashed, cutting arcs of blood and steel through the bodies of the attackers. Great windmills whose lethal arms struck down every living thing they came into contact with. <laughs> Last, it was all over. Mrs. Buren and Leyland were mentally stunned and unable to move. Slowly, very quietly, almost majestically, the bowmen and the axemen walked towards them. Their faces were bland, unsmiling, enigmatic. They stopped, bowed low, and indicated that Mrs. Buren and Leyland should follow them.
That same night, I returned to my lodgings in another part of Chongqing, full of weary depression. I'd been lecturing at the university all day on my theories regarding the vampiric cults, of my experiences with the horrific Count Dracula, seeking more information about the legend of the seven golden vampires. The faculty had received me with skepticism and a degree of polite derision. Even before I could light the tallow lamps, I knew that I was not alone in the house. And then I heard a sound behind me, and a young Chinese man came towards me. He was dressed in the white silken robes of a religious order. He called my name softly and bade me have no fear. The intruder introduced himself as Si Ching. He said he had been present at the university that afternoon and had listened with deep attention to my words, for he recognized the truth of what I had said. The village of Pingue did exist. The farmer I spoke of did die under the circumstances I've described. The temple was there, up in the wild country beyond the Yangtze gorges, north of the Mitsung Shung and the river of lost demons. And the golden vampires were still there, as was Ka, high priest of their temple. My visitor's name was Si Ching, and the farmer who died so many years ago was his great grandfather. It was at this moment that Mrs. Buren and my son arrived to interrupt his words. Breathlessly, they told me of their adventure in the dark streets of Chongqing, and of their incredible deliverance by the amazing bowman and the giant who swung the twin battle axes. Si Ching smiled and told us that we had been protected ever since our arrival in the city. He and his six brothers had seen to that. There was Kui, the fabulous bowman, Ta of the battle axe, Shi Tao, who carried a silver mace, Po Kui, whose weapon was a short stabbing spear, and lastly, the twin brothers Sung and Sun, masters of the broadsword, seven in all. And as I looked at them, I noticed that the ancient arms they carried were all fashioned in gleaming silver. Silver, a metal abhorred by all vampires. Si Ching went on to say that he and his brothers had taken a sacred vow. As warrior priests, they were dedicated to the task of returning to Pingue to rid the doomed village of the curse of the golden vampires. He believed that I had been sent by the sacred gods to help destroy the demons. If only I would come. But such an expedition would be costly. We would need supplies, wagons. Even as I mentioned this, the problem was solved by Mrs. Buren. She said she would finance the journey on condition that she could join us. Despite all my forebodings, we embarked on the journey. Something beyond me, beyond my will, seemed to draw me towards the dangers that lay above the Yangtze gorges. Our tiny band consisted of Mrs. Buren, myself, my son Leyland, Si Ching, his six brothers, and one other. This was Meikwe, Si Ching's enchanting and beautiful young sister. Delicate as a Chinese mountain flower, fragrant as the zephyr breezes of early spring, I could see that Leyland was captivated by her from the start. We had chartered a vessel to take us through the gorges, an ancient trading junk symbolically named Mao Feng, Glorious Phoenix. The beginning of the journey was uneventful. One might almost say they were happy days. Apart from the tender love that was 
springing up between Mekwe and Leyland, I noticed the way in which Vanessa Buren gazed at the quiet and dignified Si Ching. in the late afternoon of the second day following our disembarkation from the sailing junk. The sun was still hot in the sky. The barren ridges of the Black Valley were like castellated walls hemming us in. It was oppressive, ominous. The Sea Brothers knew long before we did that danger was at hand. On the ridge to our left, a low cloud of dust appeared, and behind it, a horde of black-coated warriors. The brothers formed up into a line, with the bowmen slightly to the left on a rocky outcrop. They were joined, much to Leyland's dismay, by the delicate Mei Kui, who now carried a gleaming silver dagger in each small hand. Si Ching, I noticed, carried no weapons, but stood quietly waiting with his arms at his side. Leyland and I took rifles from the wagons and awaited the attack. I saw General Leon Han astride a fierce-looking horse appear in the midst of his brigands. His arm went up and he pointed to the wagons. This was the signal to charge. <laughs> Brothers never wailed. They met the onslaught as we fired into the advancing throng. The twin brothers, Sung and Sun, stood back to back, their silver swords swinging in unison. Tar's battle axe flashing in the sunlight, and Shi Tao's great mace whirling. I saw Po Kui's stabbing spear moving like a glint of silver light. The whole scene erupted into a cacophony of violent action. Ching's fists, feet, and body moved in a frenzy of speed, speed as he smashed, hit, and lunged at the general's men. The gentle Mei Kui, now a wild cat, shadowing her brothers, her tiny form twisting and lashing out like a miniature tornado, the blades of her daggers like darting shafts of scudding sunlight. The battle ended as quickly as it had begun. A shaft from Kuei's invincible bow had bedded itself deep in the throat of General Leon Hong. I was amazed to see that none of the brothers were hurt. As for Mei Kuei, the wildcat was gone and there returned in its place the gentle tranquility of the shy maiden. 
Si Ching found a cave in which we could shelter from the icy night. The brothers were grim-faced now, and I sensed we were drawing closer to Ping Kui. I shivered and wondered if the vampires and their attendant hosts might venture out to meet and waylay us. Only Leyland and Mei Kui seemed relatively unconcerned as they basked in the warmth of their growing love. They sat together at the cave mouth, finding beauty in the turgid hues of the dying day. When it is over, Leyland, when there are no more shadows to fear, I shall cook sweet noodles for you and sing you the songs of Sichuan. We shall bathe in the tranquil waters of the Jingdi and wash away the memories of this time. You will know the scent of the sacred flowers which bloom only for lovers and know that the horizons of happiness stretch forever. Then will the warm goddess Guan Yin smile gently over us. When it is over, Leyland, when it is over. The next day we reached Ping Kui, a sad, forlorn little village, overshadowed by fear and by that grim temple. Unfortunately, there was no time to rest or recover fully. We had to prepare for the coming night. I supervised the digging of a trench across the main gate leading into the village. This was to be filled with oil. Behind it, we erected a line of sharpened bamboo stakes. We had to do nearly all the work ourselves, the villagers doing little to help. They felt that any resistance to the vampires was useless. The night came too quickly. Over to the east, I could see the distant flashes of lightning. The air was vibrant with thunder. For nearly two hours, we waited. In that time, the storm had gathered quickly. There was no rain, but the thunder crashed about our ears, and a wind tore at our clothes and whipped our skin. I felt vulnerable, weak, almost helpless. And then they were upon us. But the three remaining golden vampires, mounted on jet black stallions, snorting and pounding, glistening in the blue light of the clouding moon. In the ensuing battle, only vivid flashes remain in my memory. I know the vampires brought with them a veritable army of soulless beings. I know that they and their terrible masters swarmed over the brothers. I remember lighting the oil in the trench. I saw Tar, the massive one, drag a dozen of the undead into the flames that perished with them in a blaze of horror. I saw the vampires hack to death the twin brothers, Sung and San, severing their arms from the hands that held their swords. I saw them die amidst a welter of gold. I remember the way Shi Tao roared to avenge them, stabbing the studded head of his mace right into the body of a vampire and watching it die before his furious gaze. Then he too was struck down. I saw Ching's flashing fingers, taut as a blade, smash their way into the carcass of the second vampire, tearing out with his bare hand 
the squirming, vile heart of the monster. And I witnessed the death of Vanessa Bureau. The last vampire, the most monstrous of all, attended by an array of the undead, caught her by the shoulders and sank his deadly fangs into the smooth skin of her neck. Before flinging her from him. It was Ching who took her in his arms. Clasping her tightly, he carried her to one of the staves. They embraced as he impaled both their bodies on the sharpened end of the bamboo. He knew that this was their only escape, an escape into death and eternity from the ghastliness of the vampiric curse. It would have been the end of us all, I know, had not the villagers of Pinque chosen this time to seek their own revenge upon the monsters. Realizing the creatures were not invincible, they collected every weapon they could lay their hands on and charged the soulless ones, beating them down like driftwood before a tidal wave. The last vampire roared his defiance at them and then saw the slim figure of Mei Kue standing alone. It swung itself into the saddle of the nearest horse and rode at the girl. As it drew alongside, it scooped her up and galloped away through the main gates, ascending the slope towards the temple. Following hard behind was Leyland and the two remaining brothers, Po Kwe and Kwe the Bowman. At the temple, the vampire dragged Mei Kwe from the horse and carried her screaming inside. He laid her on the nearest sacrificial slab of stone and prepared to sink his fangs into her neck. But at that moment, Leyland stormed in and grappled with the monster. However, my son did not possess the fighting skills of the sea brothers. The vampire's fingers curled about his neck. Quay had followed Leyland into the temple and had sent an arrow tearing into the creature's heart. The gore from the vampire's mortal wound drained down into the cauldron. There it simmered ominously as the body of the creature slithered down into it and decayed into a scum of dust. Leyland gathered up May Quay and shielded her eyes from the awful sight. But it was not over, at least not for me. As Leyland, Mekwe and the two surviving brothers left the temple, I entered from the back. I called to them, but they didn't hear me. I gazed about the dreadful place. I saw the cauldron and the seven slabs of stone. I thought the nightmare was ended, and yet... A cold draught of air rushed its way through the temple. And then the very walls of the place vibrated with the sound of a giant gong. I turned and saw the shrouded outline of Ka, high priest of the temple. And as I watched, he stretched out a hand to me. On the index finger was the ring of Count Dracula. Carl's face seemed to dissolve in an oozing cloud of venom. The oriental features disappeared, and in their place was the lean, gaunt face of the arch-vampire. Almost majestically, he walked towards me, fixing me with his hypnotic gaze. His lips parted, the long, sharp fangs emerged. And 
then he stopped. His brow creased into a frown of fury. The first watery glimmer of dawn was cutting through the acrid dust of the temple. I took advantage of this distraction and launched myself at him. He flung me aside as though I were a floating leaf in the wind. My body crashed against the gong. As I fell, my trembling fingers touched the wooden shafted hammer that was used to strike it. Dracula moved towards me, carefully skirting the pools of light that were now appearing on the floor of the temple. His hands reached for my throat as I smashed the shaft of the hammer in two. It left me with a wooden stake, sharp and jagged at one end. As he leaned over me, I stabbed at his chest with all the strength I possessed. A sharp point entered his body, a velvet red blossom of blood fountained up from the wood. He tugged at the offending stake, and I thought for one ghastly moment he would wrench it free. But as he stepped back, his foot fell into a vivid pool of clear morning sunlight and his whole body became engulfed in a cloud of smoke and fire. of Pinkway still exists, though the legend of the seven golden vampires has long since been forgotten by all who live there now. The ruins of a temple still stand, casting long shadows down the hillside on clear nights. Not even the oldest of the inhabitants can recall the story or the curse. Yet, strangely enough, no one, man or beast, will venture near the place on the seventh night of the seventh moon. No one quite knows why.